What's something you do every day? Eat, sleep, charge your phone, your laptop, your portable charger to charge your phone and laptop? Chances are, if you're watching this video, the process of connecting your assortment of electronic devices to a wall charger before you go to bed has become a mundane daily routine. After all, the phrase, I need to charge my, gives us over 600 million search results on Google. In a world where so many people are in dire need of charging their electronic devices, it seems only logical that we understand the process of how our reusable batteries are charged. But what exactly does this phrase mean? Are little bolts of lightning being transferred to the cores of our smartphones? Is there a container that gets filled with green juice once the battery is fully charged? Turns out, this concept of rechargeable batteries storing energy is a bit more complicated. Like in so many other topics in chemistry, my explanation will begin with atoms. Atoms are made of positively charged particles called protons, particles with no charge called neutrons, and negatively charged particles called electrons. Sound familiar? That's because when these electrons move through a circuit, we get electricity. But we'll come back to that later. Generally, because the number of protons and electrons in an atom are equal, the atom is neither positive nor negative. However, when an atom loses or gains an electron, the charge of the atom is no longer neutral. An atom with a net positive or negative electrical charge is called an ion. An important thing to note here is that atoms prefer not to be ions, that is, when they gain or lose an electron, they try their best to become neutral again by moving electrons or finding oppositely charged ions that also want to be neutral. Now, back to batteries. All batteries are made up of three major parts. A negative anode, a positive cathode, and the electrolyte. The chemical reactions that occur between these three parts of a battery are what causes electricity. Ions in the electrolyte react with atoms in the anode, resulting in a buildup of electrons. These unbalanced electrons cause the anode to be negative. In the cathode, the chemical reaction with ions from the electrolyte causes a lack of electrons, making it positive. Now, what we have here is too many electrons in the anode and not enough electrons in the cathode. Naturally, the electrons want to leave the anode and instead enter the cathode. To prevent electrons from traveling directly from the anode to cathode within the battery, the electrolyte acts as a barrier. Only when a circuit is closed, meaning a wire connects both ends of a battery, can electrons flow from the anode to cathode. The loss of electrons happening in the anode is called oxidation, while the gain of electrons happening in the cathode is called reduction. Combined, the transfer of electrons between two materials is called a redox reaction. And voila, electricity. The different types of batteries that have emerged throughout history are caused by the variation in metals and solutions that have been used as the anode, cathode, and electrolyte. Let's take the first battery ever created as an example. You've probably heard of the term volt, used today as our standard unit of electric potential. It comes from the name of an Italian scientist, Alessandro Volta, who, in 1799, created the first battery. His invention, now called the voltaic cell, consisted of layers of zinc, 
copper, and cloth soaked in a chemical solution. Even in the original battery, the zinc, as an anode, went through oxidation, while copper, as a cathode, went through reduction, causing the electrons to flow from negative to positive. Today, the most commonly seen batteries in households are called alkaline batteries. In alkaline batteries, the negative anode is zinc, the positive cathode is manganese dioxide, and the electrolyte is the basic potassium hydroxide. The problem with all the batteries we've talked about so far is that eventually the atoms in the anode run out of electrons to pass on to the cathode. When all of the metal of the anode is oxidized, the battery is considered dead. Fortunately, the development of these non-rechargeable batteries, or primary cells, has led to the invention of secondary cells, the type of rechargeable batteries used in our mobile phones and laptops. What makes secondary cells special is that this oxidation-reduction reaction process can be reversed. When these cells are connected to an outside energy source, the electrons in the cathode are forced to flow back in the opposite direction as in the discharge process. The electrons once again bond with the ions in the anode, allow the battery's charge to be restored. Most secondary cells on the market today are lithium-ion batteries. The combination of carbon as an anode and lithium-cobalt oxide as a cathode allows electrons to be flowed back and forth through hundreds of charges and discharges. However, even rechargeable batteries eventually die. Over time, as the number of charge cycles increase, the repetition of the redox reaction causes chemical damage to the metals, lowering their capacity. The electrons lose a place to be stored inside the anode and therefore cannot flow to create electricity. Of course, the lifespan of rechargeable batteries varies by manufacturers, model, and treatment. Scientists continue to explore new options of materials to lengthen discharge and shorten charge times of secondary cell batteries. Regardless, this reusable alternative to non-rechargeable primary cell batteries has allowed our electronic devices today to be compact and practical, even if we do have to charge them more often than we'd like to.